And Lord, this night we do want to declare, Lord, that you are our Lord and how beautiful you are, Lord. We come, we stand in awe and wonder of you, Lord, and we thank you for your awesome uh, favor and love and your grace and your mercy poured out so freely upon us, Lord. We thank you for the love and the grace and the forgiveness, Lord, your loving kindness for us, Lord, and we thank you for your tender mercies new for us this day, Lord. We thank you for your great faithfulness as you gather us, Lord, to come and worship you in spirit and in truth tonight, Lord. We ask you continue to move and minister and bless us as we worship you now through the study of the word. Lord, we thank you for those watching uh, via the internet feed, Lord. We thank you for those, Lord, who the many families who make up uh, the body of Christ here at Calvary Chapel downtown, Lord. And we thank you and praise you for all you've done, Lord, and all that you continue to do on, uh, on our behalf, Lord. We ask you bless us now as we continue to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Hey, guys, good to see you, folks. Uh, just a tremendous opportunity we have to uh, uh, worship God in the middle of the week. And I know that, you know, a lot of you guys are uh, uh, working extra hard and so on and so forth. And, you know, you're tired and you're here uh, to worship God. And may God just richly bless uh, each and every one of you. We're going to be in Exodus 25 tonight, Exodus chapter 25. If you're following along on your electronic device or in your Bibles, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, just a good time to study God's Word. Guys, Exodus 25, you know, in the previous chapter, uh, chapter 24, we saw the people... Uh, the sons of Israel affirmed their covenant with God. And uh, we noted that they were very willing and agreeable to all that the Lord had spelled out for them in this uh, covenant. But as Moses took the book and read it in the hearing of the people, they again, you know, tie, uh, they, they did it not once, but they did it twice. They again reaffirmed their, their willingness to do all that the Lord had spoken. And a lot of times, you know, that's how we might be. You know, we might be very willing in our... Uh, in our minds, uh, very willing uh, in our hearts, but yet we think that, hey, the, 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 the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And, you know, we see that it's so difficult to do it by a list of do's and don'ts. We see that it's very difficult to think that we can live a life that's good enough, that we can ever come uh, up to that standard. You know, we all get irritated. We all might be irritated on the road with the traffic picking up or irritated at those... Uh, those little things that bring uh, that minor irritation. But again, you know, uh, it, it, uh, we fall so for, short of the glory of God. And really it's His grace. It's really is the, the thought that He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins as we come confessing uh, those sins to Him and uh, bringing them before Him and laying them down at the foot of His cross. They were willing to do all that the Lord had spoken. They were reaffirmed, but Moses and the elders uh, con commune with God, guys. It was almost like, hey, you guys came to an agreement. Come, let's break bread. And they commune with God, eating, eating and drinking. And before Moses went up to the mountains, uh, entering into the Lord's presence, uh, you... Uh, you have to credit Moses as a, as a man of great faith, guys, because uh, the Lord appearing on the mountain top like a consuming fire, he went into the midst of the cloud. And you got to think that, hey, it's a real step of faith. You just don't know where you're going. You've never been there before. And God is calling you to something else up to the top of the mountain. And this mountain looks scary, but because it's going off, it's a flaming, a flame with fire. And there's a cloud, a dark cloud, and it's even more mysterious. And at times, uh, you know, we ourselves, we might be going through a fiery trial. At times, we might go through that testing where, hey, our faith is being tested, and we're going, wow, man, it's getting hot here. And, you know, uh, uh, and God is saying, hey, leave, leave it all up to me. Come in faith. And the dark clouds at times overshadow us, and we think that, oh, man, this is a spooky place to be in. And again, we, we take that step of faith, and often we pray as we pray with people or pray for people, and 
uh, in agreement with so on and so forth, we say that God blessed their step of faith. Because even coming forward to ask for prayer for certain things, you know, a lot of times we might be vocal, we can be vocal with some of the smaller things. Other times we just kind of internalize it and we hold it in. And yet uh, to even come forward and saying, hey, I want prayer for this, I need prayer for that. You just say, God, bless their step of faith. Bless that time of stepping out and saying that, hey, can you pray for me about this? He went into the midst of the cloud. And here in chapter 25, we see that then the Lord spoke to Moses, verse 1, uh, and to tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution for me from every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. Rather than demanding payment or material wealth, the Lord spoke uh, uh, of those uh, whoever, whoever's heart are moved to give. He tells Moses to raise a contribution to him. And it's like God, God was the boss. God could have said that, hey, it's, it's my commandment. I'm commanding you. Give me all that you got. Turn it over, you know, pony up, you know. It's always uh, uh, been like this, guys. God is looking at the heart, not the contri uh, contribution. Or he's, he's looking at the contributor. Hey, how willing uh, are you uh, willing to part with this thing? How, how, how's about your time? How's about some of your talent? How's about some of your treasures? Are you willing to give it up to me and trust that, hey, I gave it all to you anyway. Uh, can you give some back to me? In, in 2 Corinthians 9-7, uh, uh, the writer said to the Corinthians, he says, each man must do in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I say, I'm, I'm saying that up uh, the writer was speaking to the Corinthians about a contribution that they were supposed to raise for some of their uh, uh, brethren who were poor, who were going through a real hard, difficult time. And that they had kind of balked and they kind of took their time uh, getting their contribution together. So he says, hey, you, you, each man must do in his heart, not grudgingly, or it's not under compulsion. I'm not coming to you as the apostle. Uh, demanding that you pony up and demanding that you uh, get your contribution together. But he just says, God loves that cheerful giver. And whatever we give, you know, uh, we were talking about it before. It's not only the, the, the resources, it's not only the finances, but a lot of times it's that time that you got to give, you that extra time to get here early, to be ready, to serve, whatever it might be. It takes about a lot of time, uh, it takes a, a bit of time. And sometimes we say, well, I, I, I gave, I sent a check in. But a lot of times it's, what about your time? What about that talent? What about stepping out in faith, saying that I'm not sure about this or that, but I will, I'd like to give it a try. Let's see what God has, you know, and then I'll leave it up to God. In Philippians 4.17, Paul wrote the church, not that I seek the gift itself. You know, he was talking about those that had supported him so faithfully in his ministry. He says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit which uh, uh, in, incurs to your account. In other words, it wasn't the, the money they gave it. The Lord didn't need the money. Paul didn't need the money. But he says he wanted the blessing uh, of, 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 of the gift to be given. Uh, to be received and to be uh, laid up to the account of that giver. And God was blessed. And God would bless that. And God would be pleased. And that, uh, that profit that uh, increases to your account, he said. And that profit was uh, not uh, uh, any type of physical uh, or uh, financial blessing. But it was that spiritual blessing that God was so blessed uh, with the gift. And, and, and he wanted to just... Uh, 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 Put it on the side of the ledger that went to the account uh, of the giver. So, so here in Exodus 25, two guys, it's not uh, that the sons of Israel had to give or to pay up, but it's a gentle voice saying, "Whoever's heart is in it, you know, if your heart is in it, uh, uh, this is it. He can contribute to my work." You see, it's a heart attitude, our tithe, our talent, yes, our treasures, but uh, it, it's all the Lord's entrusted to us. See, so whatever. He entrusts to us, you know, can we trust him that we're going to give it back to you, Lord? Uh, in 3, verses 3 to 7, he says, This is the contribution which you are to raise from them, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, gold hair, ram skins uh, dyed red, porpoise skins, uh, acacia wood, and oil for the light of light lighting, 
spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones uh, for the ephod and for the breastplate. And here I note that the very things that were, were uh, who have driven men for all time, guys. You know, a lot of, lot of men have, uh, uh, have been driven for the gold, the silver, the bronze, all the beautiful shining metals that men highly esteem. And we, we, we are enamored with that. We are blown away. Uh, we, we look for those bricks of gold, you know. And uh, uh, I was watching a movie about uh, uh, these guys that were recovering stolen treasure looted by the Nazis in World War II. And they stumbled into a little storeroom in this mine uh, in Germany. And they opened the door. He went in. He shined the light. And there was a pile of gold uh, bullion just stacked up uh, in the mine. And again, for all the things of the gold, all the things of the glory, all the things of the relationships and whatever it might be, uh, these beautiful shining metals that men highly esteem, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, precious metals like the uh, character Golem in the Lord of the Rings, guys. Remember that movie, uh, Lord of the Rings? He was the guy that, he was after the ring and, and, and uh, his journey, his quest to get this ring uh, had driven him crazy and it turned him really into an animal. And, uh, and men are like that. At times they're driven, uh, they're driven uh, uh, to that fact that they're after these precious metals like uh, like Golem, the ring, uh, 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 the ring that was uh, mentioned in that Lord of the Rings, that golden ring, which promised so much, but only brought separation from reality and separation from the world, separation from the people. You know, it even drove him to that point of almost wanting to kill people. Maybe he did. I think uh, he killed somebody trying to get that ring. You know trying to wrestle that ring from him. But that little bit of gold, that little bit of silver, what would men do to attain all the riches, all the wealth? And you know, I think that we could attain all the wealth of the world, but we never have the peace and the satisfaction and the joy that comes from the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So girl, gold, girls, and glory could only, uh, uh, could, could and would drive a a wedge between man and God. You know, our desire for those things can just come between us. The pursuit of riches, the pursuit of relationships, the pursuit of self-rule without the Lord. And you know, I think that's a real thing too where uh, we don't want to listen to God. We want to ignore Him. We don't want to listen to His Word because it's too convicting. We don't want to listen or, or, or uh, speak with Him because, you know, I just don't want to hear it. It's like the people of Israel telling the prophet, uh, the prophet saying, ask for a miracle, ask for something big. The Lord wants to show you, uh, show you his faithfulness. It was Isaiah. And the people said, no, we're not going to ask. And, you know, their hearts were so hardened and their hearts were so far away from God. They didn't want to call upon God to show them a great miracle, a great work of his spirit uh, on their behalf. In these verses, guys, it brings out the uh, the, the finest of your possessions, your treasure. Uh, uh, in these verses, it's bring the finest of your possession, your treasure, as a contribution to the Lord. Who is willing, he says, you know, whose heart is willing. And, you know, again, it's not all about the money, bit, but it's about, you know, our time, our talents, and, uh, and yes, of course, the treasure. And in verse 8, he goes, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I might dwell among them. The word sanctuary is an interesting word, guys, used here. It's used, uh, used here in verse 8. It could be literally translated as a place of sanctity or holiness or, or sacredness. This sanctuary would be, uh, was to be consecrated. It was to, to be set apart as holy unto the Lord. And, you know, I think that um, with this illustration of the sanctuary, you know, it, it takes it a step further because it takes us down the road when Jesus Christ came into the world, that he was standing at the door of our hearts and knocking and saying that if any man hears me and opens up to me, I will come in, I will have communion, I will have fellowship with him. And that's what you and I did, guys. We opened up that door and we said, Lord, come in. Uh, may, may you make my heart, may you make my life, 
this sanctuary set apart for you, a place of sanctity, a place of holiness because of your presence, a place of sacredness, that this sanctuary would be consecrated, set apart for you. Set apart my life, Lord, my heart, my life, and all that it is. It could also be translated as dwelling, or as the Jewish thought, the Shekinah glory's dwelling place. And can you think of the Shekinah glory of God dwelling within our hearts? The glory of the Lord. We think of this immense light. We think of this uh, unapproachable light. Uh, and yet the Shekinah glory dwelling, uh, dwelling place, dwelling within our heart. But the reason for this dwelling place was so much that the Lord would be uh, amidst or about his people. You know, even in those days, he says, hey, you know, we've come through this agreement. I've delivered you from Egypt. I've delivered you from this life of sin and death. And he says, now I want to really be dwell in your midst. So make me this dwelling place that I might be about you and you might be about me. And uh, isn't it so much like him wanting to be close, wanting fellowship and intimacy, uh, hearing the joy and laughter the, the groans and the complaints. You might go, oh man, what a difficult day at work. Oh man, things aren't going well. Oh man, you know, I got the aches and pains. Oh, I got the worries, whatever it might be. But he's hearing these things, you know. He's wanting the fellowship and intimacy. Hearing again, not only the joy and the laughter, but the groans and the complaints, the cries of happiness, uh, also the cries for help, guys, as we need his help. Things haven't changed. He wants to dwell really in our midst and really within our hearts. He dwells there and now. As long as we welcome him, he, you know, he's never going to leave us nor forsake us. We might uh, try and shut the door on him. We might even ask, the, hey, can you leave my dwelling? Can you leave my abode? And, you know, I think people have turned their backs on the Lord. And, you know, that's where it is. And that's where we got to continue to pray that's where we got to continue to be in fellowship not only with uh, with one another but with him that intimacy that communion we saw in that uh, last chapter chapter 24 that after they had come to the agreement after they ratified the covenant moses went up to the mountain the 70 elders went along and they entered into into a time of feasting with the lord and it was like hey we got this deal, let's celebrate, let's have this uh, joyous celebration that includes all the good food, all the drinking. And uh, uh, they shall construct the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, uh, verse 10, and one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. You shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out. You shall overlay it and you shall make a gold molding around it. You shall cast four gold rings in, uh, for it and fasten them on uh, the four feet. Two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side. You shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put the poles into the rings of the sides of the ark and carry the ark with them. The poles shall remain uh, in the rings of the ark and they shall not be removed from it. Guys, the, the ark, this Ark of the Covenant was made out of this acacia wood, and I was looking it up in several of my Bible dictionaries and so on and so forth. I couldn't find it under acacia wood, but it's this, this acacia wood is also known as shittim. It's described as a very hard wood, very heavy, with fine, beautiful grain. It's resistant to insects. It's described as suitable in every way for the uh, framework and for the furniture of the tabernacle. When you think of this wood, it must have been a very beautiful wood, like a, like a heavy, fine mahogany, or maybe even a, 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 a beautiful piece of koa that they took. And you know, it, it says that it was just fine. You know, one, one commentator said that the shittim grows in, uh, in areas of the world where it's very unhospitable in the, in the desert and little lack of water, but it grows big, it grows tall. And, uh, uh, it, and they likened it uh, as in I Isaiah where they describe the Lord like a shoot out of the ground, you know, came this great and wonderful tree. And they said that the shittim, like a shoot out of the dried parched ground, it became something so beautiful to be used as the furniture for the furniture manufacturer of the implements in the ark. But the ark was approximately 40, uh, 
45 inches by 27 inches by 25 inches and then overlaid with pure gold in and out. Can you just imagine that? I've seen some pictures of uh, uh, boxes where they, they store tea in these boxes and they're lightweight wooden boxes with just tin sides on the insides and they store tea, uh, the Japanese tea and stuff like that. So I said, oh, what a fancy thing that they fill up with tea, but can you imagine this heavy, solid, beautiful wood, and then it's overlaid with pure gold inside and out, and uh, it, it just represented, you know, the glory and the riches, I think, and the beauty of the Lord. But again, uh, uh, it was e equipped with rings on either side to accommodate gold overlaid poles that were to stay with the ark. And as the Lord led the people, I suppose these poles were in place for the ark to be transported place to place without hands touching them. You know, that's how uh, holy God was. Remember uh, when the Philistines took the ark from the children of Israel and uh, the Philistines, after a while, they said, hey, we want nothing to do with the ark because it had caused a lot of uh, disasters. It, the people had tumors or uh, uh, hemorrhoids were, were breaking out on them. They said, come and get this ox. So they put it on a cart uh, with oxen pulling it and sent it out towards the, um, the Israelites. And uh, at one point, the cart, cart kind of teetered and a guy reached up and, uh, to touch the cart and the Lord struck him. And I think that back then it was a thing that, hey, I'm a, I'm a holy God. You cannot approach me and treat me uh, as, uh, as an object to be touched and so on and so forth. But again, uh, it was only the priest that would be leading the people, carrying the ark uh, with, the, uh, with the two poles on either side. And just think of this now. When the guys, uh, when the children of Israel left the Mount, Mount Sinai, the priest led the way carrying the ark. They, they, uh, they took the ark. When they crossed over uh, the river into the promised land, the priests again led the way, carrying the ark of the covenant, leading the way uh, of the people. Uh, when they came to Jericho and they marched around the city, again, who do we find leading the way? It's the Lord, the ark of the Lord, with the priests carrying the ark around, marching around the city of Jericho. And even as the, the, the ark uh, moved before the people, God wants to go before us. God makes that way for us. And at times we don't want to go before God, and at times we do. We want to run ahead of God. Sometimes we get so excited or so overly joyed, or, or, or worse yet, we might get a little bit into the flesh that we're running before the Lord prayerlessly. And it's like uh, the, uh, the, the Gibeonites coming to the the Israelites and say, hey, we've come from a far land and look at our clothes, our sandals are all worn out, our bread is all crusty and turning into crumbs and, you know, can, can, you, can we make a deal with you? Can you protect us? And, you know, the men of Israel really without prayer, really without taking it to the Lord, just saying, yeah, okay, we'll take care of you guys. But really, uh, when it came down to it, the guys had lied, the Gibeonites had lied to them and they, the Israelites had entered into an agreement. Uh, that they would kind of be sorry that they made. But it, it's a real lesson that we can go before God, we can get before God. We can again say that hey, it's a no-brainer. We don't even have to pray about this. And then, uh, you know, things go awfully wrong. I suppose, again, uh, God wanted to really be in the front of the people. Verse 16 says that uh, you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. Uh, very specific here in verse 16, the covenant of God, uh, the, uh, the ark of the testimony uh, you shall put into, uh, uh, into the ark. And, uh, you know, this was the first thing. We know that uh, um, into the ark went uh, Aaron's uh, rod that had budded, had budded and so on and so forth. But here again was the first thing that went into the ark. It was the covenant of God, God's word going into the ark. And I, I suppose that, you know, representing God was his word. The, the word was going forth. And that's why we are, I think, um, we are a people enamored by the word. You know, I was just asking somebody, they said that, oh, this person is going to such and such a church. And, oh, they want to teach Sunday school. Oh, they want to take their kids there, blah, blah, blah. And I said, oh, did they say anything about the word of God, the teaching of the word of God? 
And they say, oh no, they didn't say anything about that. Uh, it's convenient, it's close. I can, uh, I can get into the teaching my, my kid in Sunday school, whatever it is. But you know, what about the word of God? You know, is it convenient? A lot of times it's not convenient. Somebody said that they, they, they saw me in Sam's Club. They said, oh, where's your church? We want to come to your church. I said, where are you going to church now? And they said, oh, we're going all the way up by uh, YPO such and such. And, I, and I, we live, we, now we live in town. But I said, hey, you know, there's a right place of worship for everyone. And all these years you've been up uh, uh, with these fellows up there and with the guys up there, the families up there. Oh, yeah, it's a little bit of a stretch. It's a little bit of a 20-minute or half-an-hour drive up there from downtown, wherever you're living. But, you know, God has that right place. And, you know, I can only uh, think about, hey, the guys that catch the bus, they ride out from Nanakuli to come worship with us. So coming from Waimanalo on the other side of the island, you know, it's not that convenient, but they know that, hey, this is where God has me. So I said, I, I told the guy, I said, then yeah, no, come. <laughs> We don't like you. I mean, yeah, we really don't like you, but I mean, no, you know, just just go. He's supposed to go. You know, weren't, weren't you accusing me of something the last time I talked to you? I didn't tell him that. But I said, hey, this guy is, he's losing it, I think, man. <laughs> the last time I saw him, he was confronting me. His wife had to pull him off of me, and I said, hey, take your dog and put a muzzle on him. You know, I wanted to stop. <laughs> Not so. <laughs> hey, but anyway. You know, there's a right place. And again, uh, the Word of God, you know, is it being taught? The Word of God, is it, are we going through it book by book? And a little bit here, a little bit there. And, you know, I love it. You know, I, uh, I started a new Bible. I told you guys a new King James. And, you know, I'm all over the place in the Word. And I'm just marking it up. I'm letting the Word mark me up. And uh, uh, I said, oh, I got this nice Bible. And it's, it's big, uh, large print, easy to read. And... I've just been reading it uh, as a hopefully daily devotional going through the Word in all different parts of the Word and just keeping up uh, through, the, through the Bible. But in 17 he goes on, You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. Uh, the mercy seat, guys, uh, uh, is literally translated as propitiatory. Right here I have a little footnote in my Bible. Uh, propitiatory, and uh, we see it also the same word, propitiatory, or in First John 2, 2, it literally tells us uh, he himself is the propitiation for the sins, for our sins. And really, John is writing this first letter. He's saying that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the sins. And when you look at the word propitiations, it's not only for a uh, for us only, but also for those of the whole world, John wrote. But propitiation is literally the satisfaction for our sins. In him, the debt or the debts, the debt is uh, satisfied, guys. It was a debt we could never pay. It was like, hey, we owed all this money. We went bankrupt, and you know, there's no way we can pay it back. And all the, the sin of the world, all the sin that we had, accru had been accrued to our account, all of a sudden was wiped out. The thing was paid in full, paid in full, you know, and uh, uh, it was paid for with the blood of Jesus Christ, guys. And he is the propitiation of our sin right here on the Ark of the Covenant. The mercy seat or the seat of propitiation uh, was right there, right in front, pure gold and uh, th these dimensions. You shall make two cherubim of gold and uh, uh, make them of hammered work on, uh, on, at the end and the ends of the mercy seat. Uh, the two cherubims with the wings, guys, uh, covering the mercy seat, their faces turned towards the seat. It's, it's there. I will meet with you, he said. You know, right here, the, my, my, my cherubims are pointing towards me. Make one cherub at one end, one cherub at the other end, and you shall make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. The cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings and facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned towards the mercy seat. You shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give you. There I will meet with you, 
from above the mercy seat and from between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. I will speak to you about all that I will give to you in commandments to the sons of Israel. Uh, we went all the way to verse 22. But the two cherubim already uh, with their wings covering the mercy seat, their faces uh, turned downwards towards the seat. It's here, he says, I will meet with you from above and between the mercy seat. This is where my presence shall be. The mercy seat covers, uh, covered in gold symbolized God's throne and um, is the uh, uh, and, and there and uh, is the hearts of those who acknowledge uh, he is Lord, guys. You know, right here. The ark with, uh, with its mercy seat would be a reminder of God's presence with the sons of Israel. You know, as we see Jesus Christ as the propitiation for our sins, he is the reminder that he is with us forever. As that mercy seat uh, would be a reminder of God's presence for the sons of Israel. Guys, um, uh, we're going to stop right here. We're going to look at the table of showbread next week and move on, the golden lampstand. And uh, There's a lot of symbolism here, but uh, I think that this mercy seat, and again, correlating that with First John 2-2, that he is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction of our sins, Guys, uh, out in this world, we see a lot going on. Out in this world, we see a lot of guys out there. Out on this world, we see a lot of guys like Gollum. They're seeking after other things, whether it might be gold, whether it might be glory, whether it might be self-rule, I did it my way, whether it be relationships, filling themselves with relationships, or relationships with substance abusing type of things, whatever it might be. You know, we've seen pe people being drawn away, drifted away. And we've got to come to that reminder that he is the propitiation for the sins. First John telling us, uh, not only for ours, but for the sins of the world. And you see, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for us, that no one should perish, but all come to that everlasting life. So we pray in that life, we, light, we pray in that vein, we know that love hopes all things, love believes all things. So in that way, we just continue, Lord, uh, I cannot convert this person. Lord, I cannot change them. Lord, I cannot take the taste away from that drug or from that relationship or whatever might be separating from them, but you can. Lord, I do my best, I commit the rest, I continue to pray. I take the, the promises in your word seriously as the yea and the amen. Not only for our sins he came to pay, but for the sins of the world. And you know, he, he repeats it time and time again. And why does he repeat it? Because we need the reminder. Don't, don't you think, guys? Don't you think that we need to be reminded? Because otherwise, you know, we can grow kind of weary. At times we grow dis, disheartened. We lose heart. We almost want to say, oh man, what's the use of sharing? What's the use of praying? But we continue in the light of the Lord, knowing that uh, uh, he came not only for our sins, but for the sins of the world. Let's pray. Father God, we do want to thank you for your reminder. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And much of the time, like in these safety meetings out on the construction side or on the waterfront, it's a continual reminder of uh, putting safe practices into play, Lord God. And here for us, the, as you repeat in your word time and time again, your love and your faithfulness. and we love that word, the loving kindness of the Lord. Uh, we see here in the Old Testament time and time again, Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you fit your favor, that you, you poured out upon us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that as we greet one another, as we pray for one another, as we remind one another uh, that, hey, we're praying for you. And, hey, God is faithful, you know, and now. Uh, uh, enjoy the ride, even the things of the inconvenience of having kids. Uh, I know I messaged a guy, say, enjoy the kids because they grow so fast. And he was kind of complaining about having to clean up after his kids, Lord. And uh, uh, it, they're big kids. And <laughs> I just reminded him, hey, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing. You know, enjoy the ride while you can because they're going to grow up so quick. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We praise you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your love. And we pray, Lord God, that you might continue to spur us on to the love and good deeds that you have uh, 
in place for us uh, to do, Lord, and to enjoy and to be blessed and to bless others. We thank you ahead of time for what you are doing and what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen.